I'm not saying people are quantum devices, maybe we are, who knows, but I'm saying modeling these complex problems as if they were discrete dice game-like problems is wrong. I'm going to talk to you today about uh, changing some of the ideas of uh, how we think about intelligence and intelligent behavior as manifested in machines. We all want our computers, our phones, our desktop computers to understand us. Uh, we want them to understand us when we give them commands. And we would like them to understand us well enough to predict things that we're going to do. And the basic message I'm going to give you here is that statistics is not the right set of tools for doing this. So let me take you through it. Statistics, as probably many of you know, is a very rigorous mathematical theory based more or less on counting. The examples that you learn when you study it, uh, always begin with gambling games. So what is the probability of rolling a two in a pair of six-sided dice? Well, there's 36 possible outcomes when you roll dice, and only one of those outcomes yields a two. So the probability of rolling a two is one out of 36. The probability of rolling a three, well, there's two ways to roll a three. So the probability is two out of 36. And of rolling a four, three out of 36. And the probability of rolling the two dice such that the sum is between 2 and 12 is 100%, 1.0. Every possible outcome can be enumerated. So the world of chance games is completely modeled by statistics. And this is the underlying foundation of probability theory. Well, this, the mathematics that derives from these observations are commonly used. We're very familiar with these. To be less politically sensitive, I've chosen a historical example. <clears throat> and we know about these polls. They call you up, they ask you a question, what do you think of, you know, what's, what's your confidence level in, uh, in this case, Bill Clinton, and what's your confidence level in Al Gore? And if 76% of the people like Al Gore, then they basically interpret this as a probability. The probability of meeting someone on the street and asking them if they like Al Gore is, uh, in this case, 76%. And for Clinton, it was 58%. Hmm. Well, we use a very similar set of theories in artificial intelligence. And almost all of the really exciting work that you hear about in artificial intelligence, all these new capabilities, really ground themselves in the same set of theories, in counting. So I'm skipping a lot of details, but more or less what happens when we understand language with machines is if we try to take some particular word and we say, I want to understand what this word means, well, we basically go out on the web and we count sentences in which this word appears. And we count all the other words that this word appears with. We call that the context. And then to find the words that mean the same thing, we find all the words whose probabilities of co-occurring with the set of words that alabaster co-occurs with uh, at the same rate. So these are this is essentially what alabaster means on the web. And I don't mean to say that alabaster co-occurs with these words, but that these words co-occur with the same words that alabaster co-occurs with in the same frequency. That's how we derive meaning uh, in words in an automatic way. And it's based on counting. This is just the application of the same theory of statistics for uh, dice games to counting words and deriving meaning. And it works, more or less. But there's a problem here. And the problem is that the theory that is grounded in dice games assumes that every possible state is enumerable. 
that all the information you have in the system is all the information there possibly is. But we know in reality that that's just not always the case. In fact, it's never the case. There's always more information. No matter how you circumscribe the world, there's always more information that may impact a decision, a prediction that you need to make. <clears throat> so let's take a, a slight turn into some studies done during psychology, and I'm going back to this very same poll. So this was done in 1997. And in response to a request from psychologists, uh, Gallup actually uh, did something they'd never done before. They inverted the order in which the questions were being asked. So they asked a bunch of respondents two questions. You know, I don't remember the exact question. Something like, you know, are, do you consider Clinton trustworthy, and do you consider Gore trustworthy? Something along those lines. And what we're familiar with in statistics, uh, you may be familiar with, is you, you run these polls until you get a certain confidence level, a p-value. So you, you continue gathering data until you've gained enough data that the, the probabilities don't change much when you start polling more people. And once it stabilizes at some, at some percentage, you, you gain a confidence that we call a p-value that your result is going to be, it's not going to change if you do significantly more, if you collect significantly more data. And that's how these polls work. But in this case, while they polled the same number of people to give them high confidence that the number was correct, when they inverted the order of the questions, they found a gigantic difference in the percentages of people that responded positively or negatively about these, uh, with respect to these two questions. And this can't be explained in the laws of statistics. This was considered a paradox of statistics. People are irrational, some scientists said. What, what are you going to do? People are irrational. They, they can't make up their minds whether they like or dislike Clinton or Gore. That's the problem here. It makes no sense. <clears throat> and the reason it doesn't make sense is because it sounds like a contradictory thing. Because according to the theory of statistics, what this result means is that some people, and it wasn't necessarily the same people being polled, in fact it was not the same people polled, but the way the statistics, the, the laws of statistics work, this implies that people can both like and dislike the same person. That doesn't seem to make any sense. <clears throat> but the problem is that nobody just likes or dislikes a person. I mean, especially if you're talking about a political figure, but this applies to almost everything. You're, what you're doing is you're boiling down something that's really quite complex into a simple yes or no question. You know, I may not like Clinton's trade policy, but I liked his stance on the environment and his foreign policy. Or maybe I liked his foreign policy with respect to Great Britain, but I didn't like his foreign policy with respect to Nigeria. Uh, I didn't like all the scandals he was involved in, but the economy was doing really well. Yeah, yes or no, sir? Did you like him or not? Ah. No. Well, what about Gore? Oh, oh, you know, I did like Clinton. <laughs> <clears throat> so in some sense, what we're doing here is applying the wrong tools. We're boiling down a very complicated scenario into something that's very simple and trying to make it sound like a dice game. And then once we've boiled it down to a dice game, we then act surprised when it doesn't behave like one. Wait, you mean there's something more going on here than two six-sided die? And the same thing is happening in artificial intelligence. So this example I gave, what if I change, instead of all of the web, instead of counting sentences across the entire web, what if I concentrate just on books, fictional books, fantasy books? 
And then I find in some book there's a character named Alabaster, and I end up finding that Alabaster means the same as other names, other elvish fantasy names that are mentioned in the same context as the character Alabaster in some set of stories. Or if instead of the whole web or fiction, I focus on science articles. And I do this very same analysis only on articles about science. And I find that in that context, the meaning of the word alabaster is quite different. It's like chalk or magnesium. But I had a good p-value, uh, uh, had statistical significance. What's going on here? You're treating it like a dice game. You're treating a complex situation like a dice game. There's always something else going on. And the problem is actually not statistics. The problem is using statistics for a problem for which it wasn't really intended. So 100 years ago, physics was faced with a very similar kind of dilemma, a story you may have heard. Some of the experiments uh, that they were conducting, the results of those experiments, similarly made no sense whatsoever. So one dilemma was whether quantum particles behaved like particles or like waves. Do they have wave-like properties or particle-like properties? Well, when you pass quantum particles through a, a single slit, you get a distribution pattern behind the slit that looks something like that. The particles collect in a kind of a normal distribution behind the slit. So you would expect if these quantum particles are in fact particles, that if you shoot them through two slits, uh, the pattern would look like that, the same as the single slit, but um, reproduced behind each slit. If, however, particles had wave-like properties, you would expect an interference pattern, you would expect the waves to interfere with each other the way water would as they went through those slits and you would get a pattern like that. And that was what they observed. And so it was concluded the quantum particles are waves. And then someone had the thought, well, what if we put a recorder on each slit just to see which slit the particle passes through? And then suddenly, it behaves like a particle. What? It is both a wave and a particle? That does not make sense. Why doesn't it make sense? Because it seems like being a wave and being a particle are disjoint. It's like liking Clinton and hating Clinton. You can't do both. <laughs> yes, actually, you can. It's reality. It's not broken. It's just the way it is. Your math is wrong. Your assumptions are wrong. Change your assumptions. So, what consequences does this have for decision making, for predicting, for building intelligent machines that can understand us better? These machines need to understand that, in fact, a lot of times the probabilities of events that are described as uh, 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 contradictory can both happen at the same time. We can't make this assumption that the probability is sum to one. This is what happened with the poll about Clinton. If we asked in a different order, we got different probabilities, and the probability of the event that we consider the contradiction of the other, not liking Clinton versus liking Clinton, it should sum to one. I mean, it should be pretty close, and it was nowhere near that. And experimentally, the sort of the, the baggage that statistics brings along, with it, me, brings along with it means that people almost never check the contradictory case because it's obviously the probability of that is one minus the probability of the positive case. Why should I measure it? I just need to subtract it from one. But you got all these other things going on. I mean, you ask someone a question when they're in a bad mood, you know, they'll probably give you a negative response. Oh, Clinton, God ah, damn, ah, I hated him. Oh, my feet. <laughs> it happens. <clears throat> so we did some experiments. I mean, that's people and opinions. I mean, come on, of course. <laughs> that's a wasteland. What about medicine? Aha, medicine. Now it's science, it's precise. 
We don't have any of those problems here. There are no opinions. It's only fact. So what if I poll a bunch of medical experts and ask them, how likely are they to, to use antibiotics to treat typhus? Typhus is the usual treatment. And we get something like 75% of them say, yes, I would use typhus. A uh, few of them say, no, I would, uh, I would use antibiotics. A few of them say, no, they wouldn't. One person actually said, are you an idiot? No one uses antibiotics to treat typhus. Well, that's what 75, oh, they're all idiots. Okay. <laughs> now, what if we take uh, a different set of medical experts and ask them the opposite question? How likely would you, would you not use antibiotics to treat typhus? We do not get an answer that what we should get if the laws of statistics as they boil down to this question being a yes no question, we expect to get a 0.25 here. It should be the complement of the first question. It's, it's just the negation. You can't use antibiotics and not use antibiotics to treat typhus. But, I mean, psychologically, what's happening here? I mean, it, 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 it com apply common sense. When you ask the question that way, they kind of interpret it as, would I use, yeah, I would use antibiotics. Would you not use antibiotics for typhus? Uh, yeah, I suppose if the patient history indicated, uh, indicated that, I wouldn't. Uh, if the hospital was out of antibiotics, if there was some kind of shortage, I might you know, use some. So they begin to consider other things because there's other things going on. This is medicine, it's not so simple. And yet, a lot of what we do from political polling to psychological surveys to news articles about what's going to happen tomorrow are making these kinds of assumptions that, I can, that are based on the observation that I can boil all this down to a dice game. <clears throat> so using classical probability theory, it's impossible for 75% of the people to say yes and 50% of the people to say no. But in the mathematics that underlies quantum theory, actually, this is perfectly acceptable. Because of the wave-particle duality, a new mathematics was derived in which probabilities like this don't need to sum to one. It's okay for there to be something called a superposition of states, where something is both a particle and a wave at the same time. And I'm not saying people are quantum devices, maybe we are, who knows, but I'm saying modeling these complex problems as if they were discrete dice game-like problems is wrong. We should be modeling them the way the, the mathematics underlying quantum theory models the universe that way. Because that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you.